Ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed with the panel discussion. I would like to introduce our distinguished panelists who are on stage. First, Mr. Angwai Chu, Chief Executive, Energy Market Authority, Singapore. Next, Dr. S. Narayan, Visiting Senior Research Fellow, Institute of South Asian Studies, NUS, and former Economic Advisor to the Prime Minister of India. Next, Mr. Henning Kloystein, Energy Editor, Asia, Thomson Reuters. And finally, Dr. Anthony D. Owen, Principal Fellow and Head of Energy Economics Division, Energy Studies Institute in U.S. The session will be chaired by Dr. Amit Dupalat, Senior Research Fellow and Research Lead, Trade and Economic Policy, Institute of South Asian Studies in U.S. I now hand over the session to Dr. Pal. Thank you, Kush, and thank you very much for uh, reassembling right on time. We are going to continue uh, the very appetizing discussions that have been set in motion by the uh, brilliant speech uh, delivered earlier by Mr. Neta, uh, outlining the challenges to sustainable energy development from an Indian perspective. Uh, this panel is looking to expand and build up further on uh, many of the issues that uh, our keynote speaker addressed and alluded to from an Indian perspective. And we would like to now take these issues forward to a broader global perspective. And uh, as mentioned in the thematic exposition that we have for the conference, uh, the objective of this discussion is to look at a low-carbon issue and in that context, uh, what are the challenges of ensuring efficient and sustainable energy? So we have a very distinguished panel out here of experts who will give their respective comments on this. And what I will request uh, the experts to do, one, uh, a general thematic suggestion that since we are looking at a regional and global perspective, uh, from your own respective uh, perspectives on the subject, if you could uh, allude to a couple of developments which you think would be very significant developments to watch out for as we are nearing the end of 2017 and going on to 2018. You could sort of probably just uh, do a couple of short term to medium term uh, developments which you think might be particularly interesting. And also, the fact that uh, we, we, we are uh, into this program as a collaborative effort between uh, an EMI Studies Institute and an Energy Studies Institute and energy cuts across the India related contemporary subjects that we research including politics, economics, and regulatory issues as well as strategic relations. So, keeping that in mind, uh, we would like this conversation to go on further and on a policy focused approach. So, without further uh, elaboration on that, let me first have the pleasure of inviting Mr. N.G. Waichin, Chief Executive of the Energy Market Authority in Singapore. Mr. Waichun has been the Chief Executive of ENA since April 2015. Earlier, he was the Deputy Secretary Policy in the Ministry of Finance from 2007 to 2015. He oversaw government revenue, expenditure and investment policies. He was also the Deputy Secretary of Industry in the Ministry of Trade and Industry from 2003 to 2007 and was concurrently the first Chief Executive of the Competition Commission of Singapore. 2005 to 2006. He has been confirmed the Public Administration Medal in Silver in 2006 and the Law Service Medal in 2014. Mr. Chu, your presentation, please. Hello. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I'd like to thank the ESI as well as ISIS for the invitation. Uh, we have heard so far about India's transition to a sustainable future. What I hope to do for my segment is to share with you EMA's journey in ensuring efficient and sustainable energy in Singapore. Um, first, I thought it's useful to set the context under which we operate. Unlike India, ours is a very simple system, relatively speaking. Uh, we believe in harnessing market competition and uh, market forces as far as possible to drive efficiency in the energy sector. That's why in uh, 2001, we've separated the contestable functions of electricity generation and retail 
from the monopolistic functions of transmission and distribution. So um, for electricity generation, we have an energy-only market, half-hourly interval. Um, it's, it's worked very well so far um, in ensuring competitive uh, energy prices. And also for the retail market, and, and the energy um, wholesale market, electricity wholesale market is complemented by electricity futures market, which allows market participants to hedge um, their pool price exposures up to two years in advance. And adding to that, we have been progressively opening up the electricity retail uh, uh, market for competition and come uh, second half of next year, to be fully liberalized. Um, so th this is the market structure that we operate under and in our policy, in our goal to promote sustainable energy, we have to do it within that context. Uh, the second point I want to make is that Singapore is alternative energy disadvantage. We do not have hydro or geothermal resources and wind speeds are low. And so solar energy is really our only viable uh, form of sustainable energy. But even then, uh, because of our small land area, we are constrained. We cannot have large solar wind farms like in, in India or in the Middle East. Um, and we are thus very dependent on fossil fuel. So 95% of electricity generation comes from natural gas, which is already the cleanest form of fossil fuel. But notwithstanding that, we are very keen to promote the adoption of sustainable energy, uh, given that it is not only emissions-free, but it also contributes to energy security by reducing the amount of fossil fuel that we need to import. But in promoting sustainable energy, we need to do it in a way that is sustainable not just environmentally, but also sustainable economically, as well as sustainable from the perspective of ensuring reliability of supply and grid stability. And so our approach for promoting sustainable energy in Singapore can be summarized in four R's. The first R is about right pricing. So we do not subsidize energy. Uh, we believe in reflecting the market price. And even for renewables, there is no fit-in tariff. And so renewables need to compete uh, based on their own merit and based on their own financial viability. But what we will do is that from 2019, we will be imposing a carbon tax of between $10 to $20 per tonne of CO2. So electricity generated based on fossil fuels will be taxed, whereas for solar uh, energy, it will not be taxed because it's emissions free. So through the carbon tax, um, the solar energy will enjoy a tax advantage and a competitive edge over conventional energy. Um, although solar energy is clean and green, we need to recognize that it can impose additional burden on the power system because of intermittency. So for example, the output from a PV panel can drop drastically when there's a cloud cover. And so, whereas individual, the impact of individual PV panels may be very small, but collectively, with a proliferation of solar energy, the impact on the power system stability can be quite significant. And so we'll need to have additional reserves to back up uh, solar energy. And this needs to be properly priced and properly factored in. And earlier this year, we have thus uh, launched a consultation paper on our intermittency uh, in, uh, pricing mechanism, which will reflect the, this additional cost, uh, and the cost will be, will be uh, recovered from the solar energy. And what this intermittent pricing mechanism does um, is to take into account the amount of solar energy we have in the system, and the higher probability of varied output compared to conventional generation and then we factor in what is the cost involved. So we believe that uh, this mechanism is fair and is in, from the principle of a causal pay but more importantly uh, it creates a price signal for the market to come up with efficient solutions to deal with intermittency to lower the intermittency and hence lower the intermittency pricing that we need to pay. Uh, we are at a stage of reviewing the feedback that we've received from uh, the industry um, on this intermittent pricing mechanism. So this is the first R. 
uh, about threat pricing. The second R is on uh, reducing uh, rules. So currently, many of our rules are based on the traditional model of large centralized electricity generation, uh, which small distributed uh, solar installations may find them hard to comply with. And that's why over time, we've reduced and simplified these rules. For example, reducing the time taken for connection for a solar installation to be connected to the grid from 27 days to 7 days. We have also um, make it easier for um, solar players to be able to um, receive payments from the electrons that inject into the grid through enhancing the, um, the our intermittent, uh, central intermediary scheme. So these are ways that we want to do, these are ways by cutting rules that we hope to facilitate a greater adoption of solar. The third R is about um, trying to raise demand uh, with government taking the lead. Uh, government being the lead adopter of solar energy. We have this solar nova program where we aggregate the demand from the public sector um, on solar energy and this has been very useful in first demonstrating the viability of solar energy and second is to give our solar energy a critical mass to kickstart the industry. The, third, the, the fourth R is about R&D, how we can leverage our technology to deal with the intermittency problem so that we can integrate more renewables into our power system. So just last month, we awarded uh, two research grants. The first research grant is to a consortium that will work with the MET uh, Department of Singapore to look at solar forecasting how we can uh, better forecast solar irradiance and solar output. Uh, so this will enable us to take appropriate and timely actions to ensure to prepare for any imbalance in the system. So that was a, a $6 million grant. The second grant that we awarded just last month is a test bed to two uh, consortiums uh, for the test bedding of um, energy storage system in the grid. So this again, you know, allow us to better deal with the intermittency problem and, and through understanding how uh, grid level storage system performs in our kind of hot and humid environment, um, we can see how we can better use energy storage systems to deal with the intermittency challenges that we may face. So these are the four R's, uh, the four R framework that we use to promote the adoption of renewables in Singapore. And we have seen solar energy adoption grow rapidly in Singapore, from roughly about quarter percent since uh, 2014. The capacity now totals 140 megawatt peak, and which is on we are on track to meet our target of having 350 megawatt peak of solar energy by 2020. And beyond that, we are looking at a target of 1 gigawatt. So that is our approach for promoting uh, sustainable energy in Singapore. Now let me talk briefly about regional cooperation. I think there's a, a role uh, in regional cooperation in promoting the adoption of sustainable energy in the regional countries. So for example, the ASEAN countries are working very closely together uh, to push renewables so there's a target with the target of uh, improving energy efficiency in ASEAN by 20% by 2020 and to increase the share of renewables in ASEAN by 20 to 23% by 2025. And to do so, uh, there are two areas that we work on, that we are working on. One is about uh, cooperation on uh, specific projects. So one example that I'd like to highlight is the power integration project between Laos, Thailand, Malaysia and Singapore. As we know, in Laos they have a lot of uh, hydroelectricity um, resources. And so the power integration project involves the export of hydroelectricity from Laos through Malaysia to through Thailand to Malaysia and Singapore. And uh, just uh, in September, uh, Malaysia, Thailand and Laos signed an agreement for, the, for Malaysia to import 100 megawatt of hydroelectricity uh, from Laos. We hope 
to be able to do so uh, in the future for Singapore as we work through some of the technical requirements. Um, another area that we work on is, of course, on capacity building. So there have been efforts uh, to, we have been workshops and seminars and organized for ASEAN together with other partners, including India, uh, to see how we can build up uh, capacity within uh, the different uh, ASEAN countries in various areas, in energy efficiency, for example, uh, in renewable policies, as well as in financing, very important uh, topic, uh, how do we attract uh, financing to energy infrastructure. So I'll stop here, I'm happy to uh, take questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chung. That was uh, very illuminating as far as the 4R framework particularly is concerned. Uh, it's now my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Narayan, visiting senior research fellow uh, in the Institute of South Asian Studies. Dr. Narayan uh, is, is uh, a very long colleague at the ISAS. He was a former head of research at the ISAS, but prior to that, he was also among his various institutions. He was the economic advisor to the Prime Minister of India till 2003-04, and Prior to that, he was secretary as a petroleum and natural gas, and also the finance secretary of the government of India. So, Dr. Nair, can I now hand over the floor to you? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Antiendu. You know, Vikram's talk in the morning has uh, really set uh, the bar very, very, very high for a discussion like this. So, I'd like to. I, I thought of a few things to say, but uh, you know, after his talks, there are so many more questions that need to be addressed, which I would like to place uh, before the audience here. When looking at uh, South Asia, or even looking at Asia in general, and I come from the concept of South Asia, South Asia today, and I was mentioning this yesterday, that Bangladesh, India, and uh, uh, Pakistan, all three together, all these countries are growing at about 5-6% on a regular basis. India more, uh, Pakistan a little less, Bangladesh steady. And the demand for energy has been doubling. It has doubled in all these countries from the year 2000, which is 16-17 years. Now it will double again in the next 10 years. In this entire region, the per capita energy consumption is in only about 300-350 kilowatt per person. Certainly with the growth, with development, this consumption will double. The region is being found fault with for high emissions because it is starting from a low base and this is the argument that India has been placing before. All the, all the climate change conventions to say that when you talk about the word sustainable, are you saying that energy use should be, con uh, should be constrained or energy options should change or energy, you should go into different things like energy efficiency, production, etc. So let us, let us highlight the problem. India today, electricity generation is 300 gigawatts, 300 GW, of which today about 40 to 50 gigawatts is renewable. If you add the hydro part of it, it comes to about 30%. Let us say this number doubles. It doubles in the next 10 years to 600 kilowatts. And the argument is that this extra should come almost entirely from renewable or at least the target is that 150-160 gigawatts of energy in India should come from renewables or low carbon uh, uh, generation. 
So low carbon generation, we have limited options. We have hydro, we have solar, we have wind, and if you extend the argument a little bit, clean natural gas. Now to put 300 gigawatts, let's, let's take one by one. If you have to put 300 gigawatts extra of solar and wind power in India, the amount of ground, land required for doing this is absolutely mind-boggling. It is no longer the cost per of generation, whether it is 2 rupees or 2.4. What, what I am saying, this argument applies to Bangladesh and Pakistan as well. The amount of physical land required to put this up is absolutely mind-boggling. There is no clarity on how this kind of a land is going to be available. What would happen to the land after this is put up? What would happen to the value of the land due to the economic use of the land? I think all the arguments about sustainable is, is simply concentrating around use of coal. But if you look at just another industry, another area, Transportation industry. Today there are 95 million two-wheelers in India, 22.5 million four-wheelers. The air traffic is growing at about 16 to 17 percent CAGR. In the next 10 years, there will be at least a thousand more aircraft in use in India by the different airlines. So fossil fuel consumption and fossil fuels are being imported by India, I would say 80%, 90% requirements are imported by India, true of Pakistan, true of Bangladesh as well. So simply to find coal as the enemy, what happens to all the transportation? Because the transportation sector is again going by 15 to 16 percent in a year. Also true of Bangladesh, partially true of Pakistan. And transportation sector for the next 10 to 15 years is going to be certainly ships, certainly aircraft, certainly two-wheelers, are going to be significantly dependent on oil. So would you, would, is it possible to argue that this kind of growth is a low carbon growth, is a sustainable growth or a non-sustainable growth? It's possible to argue both ways. For example, it's possible to say that now that Oil availability is likely to continue substantially into the future. For the next 100, 200 years, there is no shortage of oil. It's possible to argue that now that enormous new gas finds have been found in different parts of the world, off the coast of Australia, in the Mediterranean, off Libya, etc. That it is possible to argue that as the concept of sustainability if it is taken to the fuel side and say, okay, oil and gas are now much more long-term fuels than they were even considered about 15 or 20 years ago. And if we argue that, okay, gas can replace most of the uh, domestic energy use, transportation use, etc. Even then, the kind of growth in Petroleum diesel consumption is going to be enormous and significant in South Asia. Then we move to electricity generation. And this is where the, the, the coal argument comes in. The coal argument comes in saying that it is the most polluting of fuels and therefore 
replacement of coal becomes a kind of a sine qua non of, of, of removing uh, carbon emissions. Even, our, even, even taking it forward that, that okay, this, this is valid, three consequences follow immediately. One is a replacement of coal automatically means an alternate fuels. And so far as South Asia is concerned, every alternate fuel is imported. Coal India has, subs has substantial quantity, but the kind of growth that it is required requires enormous imports as well. Natural gas, gas has to be imported. Even Bangladesh uh, availability is about 16 TCF which will run out in, a, in about a decade's time. So the expressions on the external finances of these countries of replacing coal by fossil fuel and we just now, we just now saw that if it's replaced by uh, solar panels, the solar panels also get imported from China. This is going to be an enormous pressure on the finances, foreign exchanges of these three countries. And I already mentioned the difficulty of land and the difficulty of, of providing locations for this. You just look at Pakistan today, they are running a 5000 megawatt deficit. Heavy investment in the power sector is happening by the Chinese. They just put up a Saliwal uh, power plant of 1,320 megawatts uh, within a period of two years. It's an absolute record for a coal-based power plant. But the point is that that is about a thousand kilometers away from the port, and you are, you are going to have to import the port and carry it in either rail or road right up to the power plant and run it. But you know, kind of that is going to be Pakistan's problem. The Chinese have built the plant and given it to them to run. And they are getting into more and more coal based power plants in Pakistan. They are talking to Bangladesh as well. Actually, coal use in Pakistan and Bangladesh is going to not double but triple in the next 10 years. And that is because this is needed even for this 5-6% to growth. So I think, I think a low carbon Asia should not force Asia into living at a level of 360 kilowatts a year. Even if power generation is stopped totally at this level. The transportation industry will continue to grow enormously and the transportation industry itself will consume enormous quantities of fossil fuels. I think these are certain realities that we must recognize. What are the solutions that are available and maybe at the top of the hat I can, I can think of five or six. Taking primarily a, a clue from China in the last 8 to 10 years. I think the first thought that, that comes to mind is can you reduce the energy GDP ratio? Can you reduce the amount of energy consumed per, I, per unit of GDP? China has done it effectively and if you look at India numbers, India has not been too bad. Between 2000 and 2015, energy to GDP requirement has come down by 12.2%. Better energy use, better machines, better productivity, whatever. A mix of all. So, efficiency in GDP accretion due to low energy, lower energy requirement. Number one, possible, doable. Two, again taking a leaf out of China, the 
national interconnectivity of the total power grid that they have brought about in the last about seven and eight years in the whole country enables them to switch supplies. Uh, how would I put it? That if you have if you have ten sources generating distributing to 20 different uh, uh, distribution points. The, 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 the switching points have been so reorganized that the power automatically flows to where the demand is peaking. This has reduced the addition of generation capacity in the last seven or eight years by an annual 3000 megawatts every year merely by improving transmission and making sure that transmission flows reach the required uh, location with the least possible disturbance as, as fast as possible again improvement in technical efficiency a third, which already India is doing, is a replacement of lighting by, by LED, by uh, alternate uh, methodologies of illumination. This can apply to air conditioning as well. A fourth, which Bangladesh is practicing very effectively, is off-grid power, especially for domestic and local village right? Bringing in efficiencies, I think if, you have, if one were to orient investment, orienting investment immediately to bringing in efficiencies and improvements in existing uh, uh, systems, would in these three countries give us at least a 20-20% uh, room during which time hopefully technologies for storage, especially storage technologies are extremely important. Technologies for storing a moment of electricity become much more efficient. I don't want to go on too long but this, this are some of the thoughts that, that uh, came to mind that the problems are not conceptual, the problems are implementation problems. And the implementation problems have to be thought through very, very carefully in these countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Narayan, for again bringing back the focus on the quintessential challenge between the volume of growth and industrialization vis-a-vis -vis its carbon content and quality, which remains a fundamental issue for Asia, most economies, particularly India and South Asia. Uh, from Dr. Nara, we now move on to Mr. Henning Gloystein, the Asia Energy Editor for Reuters News in Singapore. Uh, for more than four years now, he was also the Deputy Editor in charge for Asia Commodities. And earlier, he was Senior Energy Correspondent in London. Uh, leading European Power, National Gas and Coal News. And prior to joining Reuters, he was the team leader for European Power Markets at Platts in London. Mr. Gloucester, please. Thank you very much. I'm going to give a few um, presentation slides. Um, uh, they're mostly going to be la uh, charts because, full disclosure, I'm a journalist, not an academic or an analyst in that sense. And we have a member of the uh, Total Force Trust here, so uh, what you will see doesn't re necessarily represent my opinion. It is, I'm going to try and give you an overview of what's going on in China um, and what implications this might have uh, beyond China and, and the larger world. So, title is uh, We have China that is going from a champion of stink to um, a global green power leader. This doesn't happen overnight. Um, but you can see there two typical images of China. You can have smog uh, and you have the world's largest uh, solar uh, power parks now, all uh, both in China. So what, what are you going to hear in the next sort of 10, 15 minutes is what's happened, what will happen, and why does it matter? So what factor? Um, now if you look at the past 20 years of China, 
is GDP growth that's a little bit uh, uh, obviously well, but you can see last 20 years, GDP growth of annualized rates of anywhere between 6 and 12 percent. So they have gone absolutely bananas in terms of um, uh, growth. Now, if you look at the forecast for futures, forecast for futures, kind of come to this one to 2050, take it with a pinch of salt. But the general expectation is for a slower growth uh, rate of anywhere between 6 and 2 percent. And this is as the industry matures, it uh, starts to shift away a little bit from the uh, heavy industry and manufacturing towards the service oriented sector. And uh, this sort of growth results into that, and that sort of growth usually looks a bit more like that. And there are reasons for this. Now, the last 20 years, if you can look at the primary energy consumption of China, it is almost, well, this is primary energy, it is uh, by the last, uh, last majority coal driven. In India, you have a bigger one, which is other. This one here does not mean renewables. This is actually a clear indicator that there's a lack of wealth. This is wood burning. Um, now, you can see other fully developed economies, they have a bigger mix in their primary energy sector, but China is trying to address that. Um, now, this is an unusual chart, and I, uh, forgive me for it, but it is, uh, we find quite interesting. So you can see here the population of a country, yellow, versus the installed capacity in gigawatts of a country, and then that silvery thing is the access um, of the people to a kilowatt of electricity. Now, by and large, you can see once you have a um, capacity per million people to um, versus one kilowatt, you are considered a largely developed economy. If you go above two, you will probably go into excess power capacity. Uh, America here is a bit weird because you have idle capacity, but you have Germany, Singapore, Japan, South Korea. They have very strong fossil fuel capacity, plus, in some cases, a lot of renewables. Then you have other fully developed economies like uh, France, that probably at a good state. Australia, they have taken off a lot of fossil fuel power and installed a lot of renewables, which is causing some trouble. And Britain, they haven't invested much in power at all. Uh, but you can see here China, Malaysia, they're sort of on the threshold. You can see that there was probably going to be a lot of growth in Chinese power capacity here, but it is not all going to be coal and gas anymore. If you go to the less developed economies, you can see that there's a huge potential if you're an investor. If you're a policy advisor, there's probably also a little bit of problem solving to lose that why is that not happening. And you can see still the difference between India and China is pretty enormous. Um, now, but when you develop from a very low developed or uh, from industry, uh, which is marked still by a lot of poverty, the policy priorities are always stop poverty, you want uh, no hunger, you want food and health access, and you want uh, semi-quality education. These are the top priorities of any sensible government. Only after that, once you've achieved those large, you really start talking about clean water access, clean air, less rubbish in, in the streets, maybe climate change for future generations. But before you haven't addressed those fundamental problems, nothing else matters. Uh, China is well on its way to solving most of these things, and it has done this at a huge cost, which has been the pollution of its world. But if you look at what's happened, uh, so this is the cost of solar panels in the last well, born, uh, it has collapsed from almost $80 um, per watt to, you can almost see here, I, mean, I think it's less than 30 cents now. China got interested exactly 10 years ago, and this is Chinese solar power capacity since then. Uh, now, this is also largely thanks to China. We've heard this in the past, in, um, today as well, that the, the cost per panel has collapsed largely in part because China has thrown so much money into this and there's so much coming out that anyone else doing it will struggle to compete. But what it has enabled, if you use solar panels, it has it become wonderfully cheap. This is solar power capacity in the world. It basically only started kicking off 10 years ago. We are now at 600 gigawatts in the world, and probably, sorry, we're now at uh, about uh, 400 gigawatts in the world, and probably going to go to 600 gigawatts by 2020. And you can see how much China has done there. You can see, however, there's a big gap in, in the middle, and that means that there's also Germany, the United States, Australia, increasingly India, Bangladesh, Thailand, make great strides. So this growth is happening. And whether one likes it or not, it is there, and it's not going to go away. Um, and you can see here what this happened uh, in what this results in. And these are um, investments into 
renewables and impact capacity and non-renewables. Since 2012, renewable investments have been bigger in power capacity than in fossil fuels. This might change again a little bit because fossil fuel prices, when they drop too sharp, no one wants to really invest. But uh, you can see there is a, a, a pretty stark trend here that is probably not going to go away. <coughs> um, this is going back to China. Now, this isn't quite up to date, but it does show you the market share of photovoltaic cells in the world. By about 2011 or so, China was way the leader and it came largely at the cost of Japan, the United States, and Germany. This isn't going to change uh, anytime soon. Um, this just tells you how, how much China has changed and that there is a political will in China to change. Um, and, and these are the results. So this is a, a political risk consultancy of Maplecroft, which this is a, a, a week or two old. So New Delhi now ranks among the world's top 10 most polluted cities, well ahead of Beijing, which we've heard this a little bit uh, earlier. India now tops the rank, tops the rankings. Uh, the worst polluting country in the world followed by Bangladesh and Thailand. So good old China isn't actually in the top three polluting countries per capita anymore. Uh, and here you can see what's mentioned this morning a few times. This is New Delhi rolling pollution versus Beijing. Um, now Beijing, I will say quite recently, is still not very good. It's, uh, so that level is quite painful on the low. That level, I haven't been to Delhi recently, but I know a few people here have. Uh, sounds hard to imagine. Um, now, but when you come to the potential of solar capacity, uh, so we've talked a lot about the price, but actually the vast majority of solar panels in the past 20 years have not become much better. So most solar panels are currently made of multicrystalline silicon. Their efficiency rate has gone up a little bit, but not dramatically. What's happening now, though, in the start of this year, is that ch the Chinese manufacturers are switching from multicrystalline to monocrystalline panels at the same price of the panel. So this means that the efficiency grade will probably go from about 22% to 26% by just flipping the same price. Now, if you're building or installing your solar panel onto your roof at the same price and you are gaining anywhere between 3 and 6% per panel, this is going to be enormous news to you. And it's going to make investment into it a lot more interesting. If you look at what's being made and probably going to enter the market in the next 5 to 6 years, and this is not sort of always five, six years in the future, but these things already exist. So these are multi-junction uh, concentrated cells. They exist um, in the high-tech factors already. The Chinese are big on this, the Americans and the Founders Institute in Germany. Now, this is possible probably in the next five, six years with the efficiency of solar panels. These still cost a lot more money, but it's coming down every year. So this gives you an idea of why investors are so hot on solar. Uh, now, this is going towards the end, then we can uh, go on, but it's not just about solar, because everyone goes on about solar at the moment, but of course there's the next one everyone talks about is the electric vehicle. Now, at the moment, the Chinese still sell in excess of 2 million new cars per month. Yeah, these are enormous figures. Um, I think India is about 250,000 a month, the United States is about 500,000 a month, and I think the entire Union, the European Union is about 300,000 a month. China, 2 to 3 million a month. Currently, they're almost all on gasoline. So two, two and a half million cars every month new, they're all running on oil. But it's changing. So every week now passes without some major news, not just in China, of course, but China is going to take this very seriously. And uh, most people who say, if you doubt it, then you're going to be in 10 years in the same position that you doubted the rise of solar. China plans to dominate the electric vehicle sales and production by 2020. That's because they have kind of admitted that they cannot compete in terms of internal combustion engine technology with the Japanese, Koreans, Germans, uh, Americans, French. So they're saying, no, we're going to dominate the next one. And that's the two electric vehicles. They also plan to dominate battery production by 2020. CATL is by far the most battery maker already. They plan an IPO for the next year to raise capital. And in order to support this, China will change market rules. They, they're even thinking about banning internal combustion engines as new cars by 2030, maybe 2035 entirely. So uh, this is a government that is pushing ahead with these things. And the final one is plastic. Plastic use is everywhere. I mean, we're not going to get rid of it. It's, it's all over me here, it's here. But uh, straws, plastic bags, everyday uh, disposable goods are going out of fashion really, really fast. And not just in development, we can ban plastic bags this year. Most of Europe puts a big charge on plastic bags. 
uh, North America is still that, but the main problem again is China. They will, at the end of this year, ban all imports of plastic rubbish. China used to be the, the, the rubbish man of the world. You just pull all your rubbish onto a ship and send it to China, and it's their problem. They made a lot of money with this. They don't want this anymore. By the end of this year, they'll ban it. So anyone who has, is creating rubbish needs to sell to China needs to think about what they're going to do with it in the future. Other countries might take it, but as so far on the scale, it's not happening. These are just a couple of people, what they say about how China's impact will be on the world. You've got Seth Kleinman, who's the chief energy honcho at the Citigroup. He basically says, largely because of China, the last decade of oil is upon you, and the next decade will be renewables and electric cars. FGE, it's a consultancy largely famous for oil and gas. They said that the world has been quite recently that if China bans the combustion engine, you basically see the entire change in the world economy. But my conclusion, and then I hand over um, back again to the panel, is so China has to change. The, the pollution and the environmental damage is so big on its economy, on its social stability, and its political stability, that, that they have to change. The government knows this, hence China has taken the steps, the first steps. Probably the biggest technological, environmental, and economic turnaround that has ever happened. And this means that China has an increasing signal character for the rest of the world also because some of the governments in the world at the moment are taking <laughs> reverse steps, but uh, China seems bent on taking over the world's green clean tech leader. Not necessarily to subscribe to Greenpeace, but they see this as economic growth. This is a core thing. Sustainability and clean tech investment isn't just a cost, they see this as an economic growth factor. This will put enormous competitive pressure on any other region that wants to compete, uh, but it also means that uh, for anyone who uses it, it becomes cheaper and better. Now, I say this because if you're a uh, photovoltaic um, panel maker like RAC here in Singapore, which I believe is one of the biggest manufacturing sites in the Singapore, yes, of course they struggle to compete, but yes, they see growth because of it, it's become so cheap, and also, lest we forget that they are owned by ChemChina, which is a Chinese company, but who invested in Singapore because the government is, has seen this as a growth opportunity. So that one, thank you very much. Um, I hope I haven't bombarded you too much with Charles and I'm back to the desk. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Gladstein. That was very, very useful, uh, particularly to have the uh, China perspective when it comes to the clean technology developments, which definitely are going to make a very significant contribution to the way uh, regional energy developments shape up. Uh, final speaker on the panel, Professor Anthony Owen. He is now the Principal Fellow and Head of Energy Commerce Division at the Kennedy Studies Institute. Uh, Professor Owen was earlier uh, with the UCL School of Energy and Resources at the Adelaide, uh, Australia, uh, where he held his Santos Chair in Energy Resources, and even before to that, he was Professor of Energy Economics at the Curtin Business School at the Curtin University of Technology in Perth. He was also the Associate Professor of Economics and Joint Director of the Center for Energy and Environmental Markets at the UNSW Sydney. Professor Alvin, please. Thank you. I'm going to focus on ASEAN with my presentation. Uh, based, I'll just walk you through some results that uh, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, published last month on the energy outlook for ASEAN. And then I want to follow that by picking up on um, an observation Mr. Metta made it, uh, during his uh, presentation. This is, of course, one of the greatest concerns at the moment in the region, not only in ASEAN but in Asia, is the uh, number of people without access to uh, electricity. And if you you can see now the total of 64 million, and it's predominantly in countries with either uh, a lot of offshore islands or uh, a lot of uh, small rural communities. The intention, of course, is to reduce this to uh, zero over the next 10 to 15 years, and, um, and, and basically that's what the IEA roadmap was undertaking. Further to this, there's about 250 million in ASEAN who have uh, no access to uh, clean cooking either. So there are two major objectives that the IEA have 
looked at in, uh, in their publication. Now, this is a table of resources in Adelaide. They're resources, they're resource endowments, and as such, they're estimates which could have fairly uh, wide confidence intervals based on them. To be resources, to be reserves, they'd have to have price, indicative prices added to them. So reserves would be much smaller in the case of oil and gas than illustrated here. But I just wanted to give you a snapshot of, um, of how well endowed the region is actually with, um, with traditional fuels. Um, the column I'd like to look at, particularly as this is meant to be looking at sustainability as well as efficiency, is the hydro column. That, the source of this actually missed out a value from Thailand, it uh, should be 15,000. Uh, basically, there's either a lot of very optimistic people in the relevant Bureau of Statistics in these countries, or there's a lot of double counting, or the Mekong River is going to be very dry in a couple of day, decades' time, because those numbers just um, really just don't stack up to reality. However, to follow through what the comment made earlier is that Laos has expressed its intention to be the battery of Southeast Asia. And as was mentioned earlier, the proposal of sending hydro from Laos, hydropower from Laos through Thailand, Malaysia, and into Singapore or Sumatra has already been uh, addressed. Um, at the moment, Laos is in conflict with some of its neighbours. Uh, regarding the building of hydroelectric plants. The current one, Dong Sihong Dam, is a 250 megawatt dam that it's proposing to build, and that's likely to have a deleterious impact regarding certainly food and way of life for about 20 million people further down the Mekong in Vietnam. Laos is meant to enter into governmental consultations with its neighbours and instead is just informed. So there is a lot of uncertainty as to the long term sustainability, particularly the lower Mekong, if uh, all of these proposals come to fruition. So it's worth remembering that um, frequently particularly the IEA, but other agencies separate out hydro from renewables when they're looking at them because it's not immediately apparent that um, they can be linked together. This is IEA projections of primary energy demand into 2040 uh, in ASEAN. And the thing to note here in particular is that the heavy reliance on coal is remaining. This is their main scenario. Um, the energy, the, the, the investment funds that have to be undertaken to bring this to fruition, to meet this demand, in the realm of $2.7 trillion, which is probably meaningless to most of you, it's certainly meaningless to me, these are numbers uh, which are very difficult to comprehend. Um, they do put out another scenario which is a sustainable development scenario. And in that, what they're assuming is that um, energy efficiency uh, takes over uh, to a large extent um, to um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from what they otherwise would have been by about 40 to 50 percent. Energy efficiency in this case is the reform of the subsidies in the region and integrating gas and electricity markets. So essentially, um, the subsidies at the moment are running, I think last year there were about $17 billion in ASEAN, and it's removal of those subsidies and increasing technological efficiency and harmonizing regulations and so on. So there is another um, projection by the AEA, this is just their standard. Um, I'll, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll skip through this. Just, just showing your projections of oil production, as we mentioned earlier, 
oil, oil production is likely to decline as we go forward. And this is the fossil fuel trading balance, and you can see that uh, by the mid, by the 2030, um, ASEAN will be importing virtually all fuel, okay, and particularly coal. Emissions resulting from these projections, and as you can see again, the, they rise by about two thirds above 2016 levels, so significant emissions of CO2 associated with these projections. Although you can see that the carbon intensity um, does actually decline, uh, both in terms of GDP and to a lesser extent per unit of power generated, which was reflecting basically higher efficiency of coal fire um, power plants and a small entry of renewables. If you go back to this, uh, uh, other renewables is right at the top of the chart, so you can see basically that the, it's not anticipated that there's going to be a great change in the proportion <coughs> of renewables producing power in ASEAN, although in absolute terms it's going to be a very large number. So, ASEAN electricity demand currently has increased over the past 15 years by 6.3%, <coughs> and um, basically reliance on gas and coal that significantly increases from solar PV from the low base. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, we've got the proposed ASEAN interconnecting grid. And just as a snapshot, hopefully some of you can read that. Um, that's a snapshot of all the proposals up for the grid. Now, that's gone through that very quickly, which I apologise. What I wanted to get to do is actually focus on a problem that uh, Mr. Meta introduced this morning, and which has uh, been part of my research over recent years, and that is the impact on markets of um, uh, a high entry, high level of entry of low cost, low short run marginal cost renewables. Uh, solar and wind technologies are characterized by a very high upfront capital cost, but extremely low, almost negligible, short run marginal cost, running cost. Okay? So once they're built, they operate at negligible cost. In markets where the market operator, electricity markets where the market operator dispatches according to short run marginal cost or according to bids by private generators who generally will bid at short run marginal cost, not always, but there are some strategic bidders usually, but if they bid at short run marginal cost, then that follows that renewables solar, wind, will be dispatched first. And therefore, they're starting to push the conventional, and in particular, the gas fire producers, down the merit order. The result is that during any trading interval, um, half an hour here, if you heard, but in some countries, five minutes, gas fire plant may not be dispatched. Or if it is dispatched, it may not op be operating at uh, financial viable, uh, financially viable capacity. So this has caused a few problems. Um, Mr. Measure indicated it had some advice about this in, for India, but in countries where there's uh, a much greater uh, installation of renewables, this has caused a number of problems. Uh, liberalised markets of uh, Europe, Australia and some of the American states um, uh, are running into increasing problems that whilst the markets were really designed for combined cycle gas turbine plants, the introduction of uh, renewable energy technologies is actually making these uh, 
a lot of these plants financially not viable. Um, essentially, uh, uh, they're becoming stranded assets. Now, there's two impacts here. One is a short-term impact, and that is that they're financially non-viable, they can close, bad luck. Okay, it's one of the risks you have when you go into building a plant, it's operating, call it a Kodak moment, okay? Technology changes, Kodak ignored it, they went out of business basically. Um, in the longer term, the major impact is going to be on risk. Private industry will not want to invest in technologies which may last 30 years if they're going to find those assets stranded within a, number, within a few years. Now that doesn't apply just to traditional fossil fuel industries, it applies to renewables as well. But renewables has the benefit in most of the countries I'm referring to directly, they're subsidised. Now, the previous, bit, how do you get around this? Now, this is a characteristic of a lot of liberalised markets at the moment around the world and some regulated markets that there's a reluctance to invest in what's now perceived as a very risky industry. Um, and the previous speaker mentioned the lack of investment in the United Kingdom. So, how do you get around it? The United Kingdom has now decided, it was a couple of years ago, actually, a few years ago that they were going to offer contracts for difference for 30 years. So essentially, for low carbon technologies, they were going to guarantee prices for 30 years. Uh, for some it was 20 years, but the, the project I have in mind was for 30 years. Now, if you're guaranteed, if you're a, a private investor, you want to have returns on your investment certainly within 10 years, at the most, maybe 12. 30 years is a long time to guarantee a price for your output. Uh, as I say, it's a, a contract difference, so it is an actual price guarantee, it's a subsidy. Um, and the British government had offered these subsidies for uh, a range of low carbon technologies. And low carbon technologies include nuclear power. And the, I don't know if people, are, some people have probably kept up to date with this, but if you Google Hinkley Point C, you'll see the argument that's been going on about a massive nuclear power plant, heavily subsidized, in my view, heavily subsidized by the British government. In the British government's view, in the Nicolas de France, not subsidized. But uh, you'll see the arguments that are being coming to, towards this. However, it, what I want to do is just step back and reiterate the fact that this is arising, the problems are arising because of the higher level of risks for private investors in any form of renewable energy technology or fossil fuel traditional technologies simply because of the risks have increased so much by the fact that the near zero short run marginal cost technologies have uh, entered in a substantial manner into the uh, into the grid. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, I think uh, that, that uh, very nicely concludes uh, an excellent diverse set of views that we have had highlighting specifically on the challenges of sustainability and I think what becomes uh, very evident is that uh, for, for Asia and its pursuit of a low carbon goal, the reliance on fossil fuels uh, continues and that's, that's probably a challenge that countries have to encounter and even uh, for a much advanced uh, energy nation like Singapore, there's still the reliance on gas, which could be the cleaner of the uh, fossil fuels, but nonetheless the, the reliance continues. The economics of renewables is uh, not really very bright in all respects. So these will continue to remain long-term challenges as uh, countries move ahead. So maybe what I'll uh, start with is that we, we have the benefit of uh, having had uh, 
10 minutes of extra time because the panelists have been most disciplined and economic in their arguments. So we have 10 extra minutes for discussion. So maybe I'd like to uh, just set off the question and answer session. And I, I have a question for uh, Henning out here. Henning, you, you alluded to uh, China and the fact that uh, there's this very large socio-political and economic cost which it has taken on to itself in course of development. So it's kind of uh, a choice that China no more can delay in so far as shifting to clean technology is concerned. But on the other hand, we also heard uh, the economic issues that shifting to that kind of a policy has in so far as, let's say for example, the market is concerned, the subsidies are concerned, the consumer price is concerned. So, do you think that China is actually going to take up all these issues uh, by shifting to an economic model which will rely very heavily on subsidies? And if so, what does it mean for the rest of the region? Um, yeah, I mean, so one thing that's important to uh, add also uh, what I presented is, and that's been hinted at here, is with all this growth in renewables that you've seen in, uh, in China, it's not like coal is going away immediately. It's, uh, they're still building a, a vast uh, fossil fuel amounts as well. But it is true, so they're investing a lot of money into these aspects. Uh, they, they, they're favoring some investment over others, which includes subsidies. Um, and uh, from what I, from what we see from what we report is they're, they're very serious about going forward. I mean, if you look not just renewables, just this year they have moved millions of households from using coal as a heating fuel to natural gas to a point that they've not quite uh, sort of foreseen how much that will uh, increase the gas demand in China. So we've seen this this week, um, gas prices in China for uh, liquefied natural gas, for which there's an internal price in China now, has gone through the roof. Uh, LNG imports to China have, will in November hit an absolute record uh, to a point that the government didn't foresee this. But you can see through that that they've got these, these forced movements from, of millions of households from coal to gas, that they're incentivizing um, provincial governments to clear land for uh, large-scale renewable projects, that they're very, very serious in, in addressing um, uh, these issues. And, I mean, the cost, the social and economic cost of pollution happen enormous to China. And uh, as we've heard, they are now also enormous to, in India and in many parts of Southeast Asia. Um, and I think they're aware of this, but I, I think the core point to, that we keep hearing um, is that there's been a slight shift in the last, I don't know, three to five years in seeing investment into um, sustainability or clean energy as a pure cost factor towards seeing it as an opportunity to make money, whether it is make, taking money from subsidies, or because technology has become so much better that free investors are going to say, well, if I'm going to spend, let's say, $30 billion on one project for the next 30 years and expect return on investment, versus another one which might be cleaner, I'll take the cleaner one. And I think that's a shift that's happened, and the government in China sees this as a future growth prospect rather than just a, a policy to clean. I think they see it as a problem. Yeah. Uh, that, that's interesting, and in fact, uh, this is where I, I, I want to move from China to Southeast Asia as a region and uh, take up a point which uh, uh, which was alluded to by uh, two of the speakers, both Mr. Chun and uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Paul. Uh, you both alluded to ASEAN and the fact that uh, ASEAN is working on uh, the renewable energy uh, goal, a certain goal to be achieved by 2020. Uh, this one was true that you alluded to, and at the same time, Professor Pavan also mentioned about the fact that there's very heavy reliance on ASEAN on coal as of now. Now, uh, 2020 is not too far away from where we stand today. And uh, there's a question for both of you how much realistic progress do you actually expect the ASEAN to achieve over the next four to five years in terms of shifting decisively? from a fossil fuel mix to a renewables. Uh, maybe I can start. Um, ASEAN um, is uh, serious about uh, promoting uh, renewables as well as to improve uh, energy efficiency. 
So as, as a shift uh, towards renewable, um, of course, the various ASEAN countries are doing their best. For example, as I mentioned, you know, um, um, Indonesia is looking at geothermal, right? As a, as a possible source, um, and you know, hydro uh, from, from Laos and exporting to other ASEAN countries. So these are some uh, concrete uh, initiatives that are, that are ongoing. But ASEAN will continue to have to rely on fossil fuel because ASEAN still face energy excess issues, as pointed out by Professor Owens, um, and, and also because of cost, right? Um, and due to the archipelagic nature of countries like Indonesia and, and Philippines, there are some places that are still very um, hard to reach too. And for those uh, countries, uh, instead of uh, coal, uh, of course we can make use of renewables that will be best, but we have to think of uh, gas as a transition fuel. And so one uh, area that ASEAN is working on is small-scale LNG. How can we have small-scale LNG to be able to transport LNG in small quantities to different islands in, in ASEAN uh, to support you know, the power needs of all those areas? Thank you so much, Mr. Chu. Prof. Oh, your views on this? I think uh, one of the, the problems is that there's a supply shortfall in a lot of ASEAN countries. Right. And uh, the way to overcome that shortfall is really to move into the cheapest form of box supply of power. Right. Plus, uh, more efficient infrastructure. Uh, it's no good having the power generated if you haven't got delivery. And it, it, essentially, um, I would have thought that whilst renewables are going to increase significantly in their impact on the system, a lot of it's going to be off grid. Um, and again, a lot of it, it a lot of uh, the investment in renewables, um, it's, sort of thing there, it, it's not seen uh, because um, it's it's. It's built in its rooftop, for example. That reduces demand, it doesn't increase supply. So you actually don't see, what happens is demand is going up more slowly. You don't see any effect on, on, on supply. So, uh, I mean, one of the ways, I think, is that we can building regulations in perhaps some of the richer countries to, in order to encourage PV being put in at the, the initial stages houses and and so on. And then that leads on to perhaps peer-to-peer -peer trading, batteries, virtual power plants and so on. But they're all going to be relatively small. The idea is to get uh, is to get power through to the need at the moment. And I think basically significant, but uh, it's not going to have great impact. Thank you, Professor. And before we uh sort of go to the floor. I, of course, have to uh, come back to Dr. Duran for so, probing him on an issue on which uh, uh, we did not get to talk much in the context of uh, the low carbon Asia, but so what I'm alluding to is oil. And the fact that uh, you know, when we look at uh, sort of uh, developments that might influence the quest of countries to move towards a desirable pattern of energy quality and mix in their economic growth, I think oil continues to remain a very significant variable. For the last three to four years, and particularly in the context of India, we have been referring to the fact that global oil prices have been going southward. That's been a windfall gain for economic policy because now that has started changing. So global oil prices are bouncing back. So, do you think this, in the medium term, will make an impact on the way countries address their medium term and long term energy futures? Thanks, Amitindu. I think uh, what we are seeing and what we we'll probably see, uh, for at least the short medium term, just for four or five years, is that oil prices. Uh, which have gone up from last year significantly, which probably stabilized in the 60 to 70 dollar range. Various reasons for this, including the 
want me to avoid new shale fields from um, US coming in, sort of some more stability, the OPEC uh, numbers getting more steady, etc. But uh, uh, again, if you look at the South Asian context, the availability of oil uh, and the, the, the demand for oil products, I don't think is, 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 uh, is going to come down. And the way perhaps uh, that, that this is trying to get addressed is through improvement in efficiency of combustion. And this is happening uh, first in the automobile sector through a number of uh, hybrid vehicles, alternate energy vehicles, better uh, uh, vehicles with reduced emissions. Even in the two-wheeler sector, more electric com combustion uh, vehicles coming out in India. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the, I would say, uh, among the aircrafts, our uh, the demand for more fuel efficient, longer range uh, aircraft. So, again I go back to the thought that the rate of increase of energy use per unit of GDP is definitely going to be much lower than it has been in the last 10 or 15 years. And this itself will result in substantial savings. And the refineries modernization would be able to utilize much more products out of the crude. And a lot of zero residue refineries are likely to, are likely to be uh, made available. Which uh, in fact means that you are able to use the best, you are use the crude much more efficiently. So I, I would focus not on availability, but on the efficient use of the, of the oil, uh, that's going to be very good. Thank you so much, Dr. And now let me have the pleasure of opening up the, the discussion to questions and comments from the floor. Uh, please do identify yourself and also if you have a particular panelist on your mind whom you want to respond to your query, please indicate that. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Delphon Lee from the Energy Studies Institute. Um, I really appreciate uh, the topic of low carbon, not just to embrace the, uh, the energy or the electricity part only, but I think Dr. Narayan, you covered the transportation side as well. And I think um, um, our friend from Thomson Reuters, uh, Mr. Klonik, has done a really good update on the China uh, not just on the fossil uh, shift into into you know solar, but also into shifting into the transportation aspect. So so coming back to Mr. Mehta's point this morning, you need to take a holistic view uh, of the entire energy cycle, uh, whether it is transportation, air or maritime, or even on the ground, uh, but also on the the use of energy, fossil and otherwise. Uh, so, so th there was a very interesting uh, discussion in this area. Uh, my, my question is really uh, to Mr. Ng. Next year, Singapore is the chair of the ASEAN. Uh, it's a unique opportunity uh, for Singapore to play a role in this regard, not just in the Singapore uh, energy market perspective, but also as a driver of the, uh, of the ASEAN initiatives. Uh, I heard, a lot, I heard a lot about China. Now we heard a lot about South Asia. How can Singapore, even as chair of ASEAN, uh, join the two pillars, China, South Asia, into a kind of a capacity, uh, in, the, in a start capacity building uh, kind of a activity to bring the awareness that it is important, that the world is interrelated and interlinked and it is not just a, a sub-regional uh, only. So, Mr. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, as you mentioned, next year um, Singapore will chair uh, ASEAN. And for the energy track, uh, we intend to build on the good work uh, done by uh, this year's uh, host, uh, this year's ASEAN uh, chair, which is the uh, Philippines, to uh, 
facilitate and play our role in continuing to encourage ASEAN to move towards a sustainable energy future. And there are various uh, ideas that we have in mind. Uh, of course, these are not uh, concretized yet. We need to discuss with our ASEAN colleagues. So some ideas they are working on um, include, for example, um, in the area of um, digitalization. So um, given you know, uh, the need to integrate more renewables, um, the advent of uh, smart meters, um, and also increasingly uh, the rising threat of cyber, rising cyber threat in the energy sector. So how do we deal with uh, these problems? So the opportunities, there are also challenges. So another possible area we're looking at is um, LNG uh, cooperation. How can we enhance uh, LNG uh, linkages and connectivity within ASEAN? So the third area that we are uh, thinking of is of course you know, to, build on the uh, to, to build on the efforts so far to strengthen capacity building in, in ASEAN. Uh, and, and for that actually ASEAN is not working alone. ASEAN is in fact working very closely with uh, dialogue partners, you know, plus three, um, and also the EAS contacts that will include you know, countries like India, Australia and New Zealand. So we are doing uh, uh, these, and it's not just uh, with the, the partner countries, it's also with the international organisations, uh, with uh, IEA, with IRENA. Um, so, so this year for the first time with IRENA, uh, we had a, the ASEAN Minister had a dialogue with uh, IRENA. So I think that's a good start you know, uh, that signifies the importance of renewables in the ASEAN's energy agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chu. The next question. Yes, please. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Ng as well. Mr. Ng, uh, with regard to the uh, carbon tax that is coming up for Singapore, how do you see the agenda uh, course here in Singapore? How much of the tax will be passed through? And uh, how would that, or that, are there any mechanism in place to make sure, ensure should they pass through 100%, how would they insert mechanism there for the JNCOs to improve the efficiency? Thank you. Um, on common tax, uh, as mentioned, the you know, government has announced a common tax of $10 to $20 uh, per ton of CO2 for 2019. So consultations are still ongoing, you know, the legislation, etc. Uh, but in the, for the energy sector, uh, what we foresee is that uh, basically uh, the CCGD plants using you know, uh, natural gas, because of the emissions, we just see the cost of the input cost go up. So it's no different from you know, if the uh, oil prices will go up, gas prices will go up, and the input prices will go up. So ultimately, uh, what, will be, and, and what will be passed through to consumers will depend on the demand and supply factors. Right, um, but I think overall, you know, given that ninety-five percent of electricity generation comes from gas, overall, I think there's a rise, you know, in the energy energy prices, and that should translate uh, to higher electricity prices. Um, for the uh, and for the Jenkos, uh, what we hope is that because of the carbon uh, price, it will incentivize them to try to run their plants more efficiently, right? Because if they run more efficiently, you know, you can, you can, if you reduce the carbon emissions, you know, they'll be subject to less tax. So there's a mechanism to, to, to encourage them to be more energy efficient. And also it is a signal for future plantings. So future plantings, you know, will have to take into account carbon tax. So they may either go into, you know, a more efficient you know, H-class CCGTs, or if they're interested in going into the uh, renewable space, you know, of course, they can do so as well because uh, for renewables, they will not be subject to carbon tax. Thanks so much, Mr. Chung, again. Yes, sir. Please introduce yourself. Yes, hello, my name is Peter Godfrey. I'm the Regional Managing Director of the Energy Institute of the UK. Um, it strikes me listening to the conversation that there are kind of two things that I want to talk about, two dilemmas that haven't really been mentioned um, to, to a large extent. The first one being um, the issue of how we value social and environmental value in today's world. We talk about carbon tax, and uh, Wei Chung has just mentioned some issues around Singapore and the introduction. But again, from an ASEAN perspective, a question to you all. Is there a role that um, regional uh, development organizations such as ASEAN should be playing 
in trying to come up with some sort of unified opinions around how we begin to value social and environmental issues more into the price of our energy investments. At the moment we're using subsidies, we're using carbon taxes. These are all pretty crude ways of actually valuing value from a central government point of view that perhaps need to be developed further. And I think there is a question there that needs to be answered, needs to be debated, not only on a regional perspective, but also from a global context. The second dilemma, uh, and I refer to Mr. Narayan's uh, talk about India, um, is that of course from an ASEAN point of view, particular in a developing world, um, countries have a dilemma, uh, and this includes China, but more specifically in India, where energy has been managed through a centralized government controlled way, with base load generation, coal-fired generation, which will continue. Whereas a lot of developing countries have the option of developing microgrids and a much more distributed generation model going forwards, which actually then negates coal to a certain extent because coal is very much a base load generator. So the issue and the dilemma between central versus decentralized control and whether one leapfrogs the utilities model that was the model that the West used, the UK's used, America's used, and moves to a much more balanced view between how microgrids and distributed generation work versus the old central utilities model, I think are two major issues and two major dilemmas that need further debate. I'm interested in your opinions. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe what I'll do is I'll first uh, ask uh, uh, Professor Arun and him to respond to the uh, ASEAN context of the question. Uh, Mr. Chung, you're please welcome to give your comments as well. And then I'll come back to Dr. Nirai to uh, address the India specific aspect of this question. So, Professor Awan, maybe you could be here. Uh, ASEAN is represented, as you're aware, with the ASEAN Centre for Energy. And uh, I would say it's their mandate if there's going to be something done ASEAN wide to undertake some sort of social valuation. Um, they, it, this is a, it, it is a dilemma because um, the, in terms of the subsidies, because n no sensible government really wants to be issuing subsidies for fossil fuels. Um, it's because there clearly isn't a very effective social, social welfare structure in, involved. Um, so, it, the IEA is a bit flippant about this, with a wave of the hand, it says get rid of all fossil fuel subsidies and, um, and, and these will be your reductions in CO2 emissions and so on and so forth. Uh, it doesn't offer a concrete solution and I think that's what you, your question was about and um, I don't have an answer. Um, it, the, in developed countries, it's, it, you can target where we have a taxation regime which is personal, you can target people much easier than in countries where most of the taxation comes from sales taxes or, or very few people pay taxes or are recorded. So it's, it's a very easy thing to criticise for the IEA, it's a very difficult thing to, to overcome. Um, Basically, you can start giving out tokens and so on, but it's, things get so inefficient. So I, I don't have an answer to that so, dynamic. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Henny? Yeah, so Peter, you mentioned the one thing, so how do we value social and environmental issues? Um, it's a valuable one because indeed uh, it's, the same, it's a similar argument about taxes uh, and subsidies, but um, I think an important factor in Southeast Asia and Asia as a whole you need to keep in mind in this and there is a value attached to this is uh, not just governments but cities compete. They compete in terms of investment, uh, in terms of expats and, and one. Um, and the, the competitive factors that will pop out everywhere is things like reliability of the law and security on the streets. 
security of energy supplies, i.e. to avoid blackouts, uh, quality medication for yourself, for your children, traffic congestion, cost of living, and more recently, <laughs> pollution. If you talk to people, you know, people who don't want to live in Shanghai anymore and expose their children to that amount of pollution. Bangalore, um, in the last 20 years, has turned from sort of a garden city into a city where there's been all sorts of reports about climatic collapse. More in Southeast Asia, Jakarta, is traffic, um, Manila traffic and pollution. And here we are in Singapore, and most of these questions have been answered quite well. Um, and, and it is a success factor, and I think that is probably a reflection of valuing these environmental and social aspects. And you can see um, how they've been treated and valued by, by uh, governments and we uh, see um, What's that? Sure. Um, just uh, two quick comments on, on the two issues raised by Peter. Uh, the first issue for us, and I think the priority is first is to um, reduce the amount of fossil fuel subsidies. And if you look at countries like the Philippines, they've moved away from fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, they've also cut down their subsidies, uh, taking, uh, taking advantage of the fall in uh, oil prices. So there have been some movement on that front. Um, on the second question about centralized versus decentralized generation, it is a fascinating question. Uh, it is also about uh, national grid versus uh, uh, microgrids. Right? So for uh, islands, so for off island solution, I think having a microgrid will complement the national grid because it will provide access to, to, to consumers who otherwise would not uh, have access to electricity. So it's a positive addition. Uh, but the more uh, intriguing question is uh, the role of uh, microgrid within a national grid. So um, increasingly with distributed generation, um, there will come a time when a business model uh, will come out to, to make it viable you know, for uh, microgrids to be run efficiently and cheap, cheaply, very cheaper than a national grid. So uh, when that comes about, uh, what do we do? Right. Well, the national grid becomes actually a network of microgrids. Right. Uh, so, I think it's still early days. We have to see how things evolve. Uh, but certainly, when it comes to uh, planning of the national grid, uh, this possibility, you know, the, the, the increase in distributed generation, the possible emergence of microgrids, will need to be taken into account. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, Microgrids versus national grid. In a way, uh, I would say a little bit of a deja vu here because in India, in the 50s, we had a large number of small companies uh, in central India, in south India, which were, which were actually distribution companies and which were also small generating companies. What happened then was, over a period of time, these companies were private commercial entities and therefore were not interested in, in extending their grid to the rural areas. And which was very important at that time for India because a rural electrification was necessary for improving agriculture, for improving food production, for improving, uh, I mean, for going into the Green Revolution. So these grids over a period of time amalgamated and the central grid, which is the only grid which was capable of doing the distribution and the, uh, the grid management, took over and that, that is how the, the centralization of the grid. So it's a bit of a history there, history of uh, so 50s, then 60s, 70s, 80s, then you have all in the 80s, you have large central grids happening. After the 90s and 2000s, now you do have smaller microgrids, especially in the export processing zones, okay, which, are, which is the, the, the zone owner creates, uh, creates generation capacity which it supplies to the old export industries. Uh, in, 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 in a similar way, there are smaller microgrids which are, which are operating. For example, a big uh, generator like, like Adani has laid a big transmission line right up to Haryana where he is uh, supplying to 
uh, particular industries. Actually, there's something called the changes that happened in the Electricity Act of 2003, and which enables the buyer to select the supplier from which, of course, it requires interconnection, it requires uh, grid transfer, etc. But uh, this, this has happened. So, finally, it's a question of economics. It's a question of economics and distributive judge justice. It has to be useful for the microgrid owner to be able to capture customers who will pay and to make it viable. And distributive justice, it has also to be possible for people who need it, like, like a guy in the hut requires, a, a, requires a, a, a light, a simple electricity, and for schools in village areas, to be for them to be able to access this. So it's a kind of a balance between the two. Thank you, Rupna. The next question is, yeah, I, maybe I think what we should do is, since we have just about 12, 30 minutes left for the discussion, maybe let's pull in the questions. So I see two hands, three hands, okay. So let those be three. Sir, you first. Uh, I'm Jim Kidd from Uniflow. Quick question. Nobody has mentioned anything about feed-in tariffs. So is that good or bad? I mean, how do you see it going? Because it's going to be a push factor or a pull factor. Thank you. Power tariffs? Power tariffs? Uh, uh, FITs. Feed-in tariffs. Is it yes. still a necessary evil? Uh, yes, please, sir. Uh, So um, my question is actually for anyone on the panel, essentially, I think during the discussion you did address the fact that there is sort of a conflict between um, industrializing economies in Asia and, you know, sort of the, the shift towards lower carbon energy. But like you said, I think particularly in countries like uh, India, for example, you're not going to see coal just fade away. So do you think a possible solution for that could be emissions trading, like what China has said that it plans to do nationwide. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, I would like to get the reply of the question of Dr. Narayan and Mr. Royce, and of course the other panelists can add. Okay, my question is on actually balancing the short term and the long term. You know, and, um, and South Asian countries, for example, like Pakistan and Bangladesh, the things that, you know, as we, uh, for Pakistan, yeah, the elections is next year, and then they're going to fulfill the energy requirement very fast because you know load shedding is a key problem. And the thing is that when you have to fulfill, when you have to increase your energy generation very fast, the, the government has achieved very little uh, time to actually worry about the uh, about the environment, about the carbon factors, and all that. And you know, if you if you invest in uh, clean energy sources. Uh, I think the the offside is that number one, it takes a very long to like, start those those projects. I mean, you get the returns after some time, there's construction time, and then the initial cost is very high. The returns comes comes later. So my question is that, to what extent do you think that the government are challenged balancing the short term and the long term, especially you know when you're to face the electric elections and and all that. And uh, just, just to just to add, 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 just to add, add to that. You know, it's not only the elections, but there, there's many other sides to this. Is that if you don't um, increase your your electricity generation fast, it actually affects affects your, your foreign investments, both for manufacturing and all that. So I, I'll end it there. Thank you. Okay. Another question, please, sir. Okay. Yeah, Jonathan from Energy Market Authority. Just like a question uh, um, on nuclear power generation. We're talking about low carbon in Asia. So, um, quick, get some views on what, what's uh, ongoing in South Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. So, maybe we'll go in the order in which the questions came, or who would be happy to respond to the FIT tariffs question? Yeah, Mr. Chung. Uh, on FIT, is a good question. You know, do you need FITs? Um, my, my comment is as follows. First, you know, in the context of Singapore, uh, we don't believe in FIT, right? Uh, what we do, as I mentioned, is to tax the sinners, right, which is uh, the polluters. So for some fossil fuel, we impose the tax to reflect externalities that they impose uh, 
on the environment. So that is one way. Of course, another way is a carrot approach, right? For um, for renewables, given that they're cleaner, you give a subsidy. So you, you can work both ways, but uh, in, in, in our system, we think it's better to tax the sinners. Uh, then on FIT, it is, the challenge is that it's not uh, easy to get it right. right? Uh, because FIT sometimes uh, require you to forecast what's the amount needed, the top up needed, right, to make renewables uh, economically viable. But with the fast moving technology, uh, there's a tendency for FIT to be overly generous. Right? And some of the FITs have been locked in for many years. So this uh, creates a cost, this adds burden to consumers. So I understand, for example, in Germany, you know, the, the cost of supporting renewables is about 6 uh, euro cents per kilowatt hour. So, so that's a lot. Um, and, and countries are also moving away from a pure FIT to more auctioning, you know, to have a more tender market-based system. Uh, to determine the kind of subsidy needed for renewables. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Rob, I wanted to know, since I did indicate I wanted to, but the answers have been very comprehensive. Okay. So, uh, uh, so, hey, uh, uh, now, to very briefly, since you mentioned yeah. Germany, and I, I know that example fairly well, is uh, if you have a carbon trading scheme where the price indicative or price indicator of the um, euros per ton of carbon isn't high enough, plus you have an FIT system, you are running a very, very high danger of um, making natural gas as unattractive and uncompetitive, uh, almost as coal, or I mean, you're just pricing it out of the system while you're subsidizing renewables, and the result of Germany has been um, uh, that, uh, the, that you're running coal plus renewables, not as initially planned, natural gas plus renewables. So it's been an, a side effect. Um, and a lot of things, people, what you hear about tax, um, versus uh, a carbon trading scheme is now, and I don't really know whether it's the right answer, but you have a lot of um, um, sort of negative sentiment about carbon trading because you're trading a negative good. So uh, as, as you just said as well, well, if it's a negative good, why don't you just tax it uh, punitively uh, and through that favor or something else. I know there's strong support for carbon trading, still China still wants to do it, uh, but um, those are things that uh, the last 10, 15 years in Germany have, uh, have popped up. And just would you like to uh, sorry would you like to allude to the question of nuclear power? Would you have uh, any comments to that? Uh, so on nuclear power, I mean, uh, if if governments decide they want to do it, um, once you've invested in it, once they're operating, it's uh, you, they, they they run. But um, you just mentioned um, the UK cost. I mean, um, so there's a strike price. I think it's ninety pounds per megawatt hour. Um, that they've guaranteed, and the actual price in Britain is about forty pounds per megawatt hour. So you're guaranteeing thirty years of a strike price of ninety pounds. Um, so that's what one hundred and seventy Singapore dollars per megawatt hour. You're guaranteeing over thirty years. Power station costs, I think, in US dollars now, probably about thirty billion dollars for two thousand megawatts. So um, you ask a lot of investors, like, well, if you give me thirty billion dollars, um, I'll, I'll give you more than two thousand megawatt, um, and. A lot of people just say, well, what, you know, the ultimate, um, and I'm not even talking about the ultimate risk of a meltdown. Uh, I've had two in my life, I've never been in once, but uh, they do happen. Um, and, but what about the waste? There's no company that guarantee, can guarantee you waste, that, which will form a waste issue over who knows how long. Uh, companies don't exist that long, most governments don't. Um, and there's the last point, is if you call an investor an insurance company and say, will you insure a nuclear power station on pure economic terms, they'll, they'll, they'll hang up on you. Um, so, uh, and, then, and then politics happens. If, I, mean, I don't know how the Singaporean government would react if, this, um, if a nuclear power station would pop up on Bintan um, soon. I, I think, in my view, uh, uh, it causes a lot of problems without actually solving that much. All that said, France runs pretty well on um, a lot of nuclear power stations, and now they will say, well, we have low emissions because of this. So, you know, there are two sides to all these arguments. So, I you want to make just, a comment. I agree with that. And just to add to it, uh, you won't get private investors backing these plants. I mean, um, well, I gave the example like, in the talk in Australia some time ago. Um, if you said to if the CEO of a power company said to his investors, look, I've got a good idea, I'm going to spend $10 billion on a nuclear power plant, but you won't get any 
power for five or six years, if you're lucky, maybe seven or eight years, and then the revenue will start coming in, then either lock him up as insane or just throw him out. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous um, investment for private industry to go ahead with. And that's why in the UK, and uh, there's getting heavy government subsidies, unrealistic government subsidies, and in um, other countries going ahead, it's, the, it, it's state run enterprises. You won't find them being encouraged in liberalised markets unless they're very heavily subsidised. Um, just one point with the feeding tariffs, which wasn't mentioned, and I agree with everything that was said, is it, in a sense it's a bit unfit. They, they, you've got to have a sunset clause on them. You can't keep them in place forever. And it's determining not only their value, but how long you allow them to run before you, you shut them, shut it out. But it does, it's a bit unfair on the bidding system because it allows um, uh, the, the technology having the feeding tariff, it allows them to be negative into the market to get dispatched. Um, and remember, you're bidding groups, so you're in, in slots, so you don't have to have all your money in the negative, but it, it ensures they get dispatched, um, which is, to me, it's a bit unfair that they're using a subsidy in order to get dispatched. Thank you, Sir. Sort of. I have two questions for you. One, uh, which, which lady the corner had over the emissions treaty, from an Indian perspective. And Anisha's question on the political economy between shifting to a no, on the emissions trading, I totally agree with my colleague here that uh, so there's a concept that, as you said, you're, you're, you're trading something which is negative, you're trading on cost uh, with somebody who is willing to buy, buy that because he's not able to live up to his emission standards. So, what kind of, uh, I'm a little, little, what shall I say, not sure whether that's the right way to go. On the short term versus long term, I, I, I do think again we can look at China and say it's not a question of short term versus long term. The long term is made up of a lot of short terms which fit into. So once you have a long term goal clear that I am going to reduce emissions, I am going to improve efficiency, I am going to go transition to a different technology, I am going, uh, going to make sure uh, that, that, uh, that everybody gets uh, clean and good energy. And then you work your way back and say, okay, therefore, in order to get there, what are the kind of short-term steps? And that may require you to rethink what you're doing now. Should you be going the same way or should you be going differently? As I said, I just mentioned, improvement of efficiency is a very, very quick way. In, in India, for example, 70 to 80 percent of the coal-fired plants are, are, are suboptimal or subcritical. They've been built up 30, 40 years ago. Just like converting them into more critical, better, uh, I mean, lower emission kind of uh, plants, you, you get generation, you get uh, power, and you probably get more power, and you get cleaner power. So I don't think that we should think of it as a trade-off at all. Anish, you had a question on the political economy, right? Uh, particularly for a country like Pakistan, which is... Yeah. Oh, okay. to political goal of shifting to a no, uh, you know, Pakistan is a very peculiar, uh, currently, at the moment, Pakistan is in a very peculiar situation. Okay, they are shortage. But they have decided to be heavily dependent on China for infrastructure. So you see, all the bits that are happening uh, uh, are being, and there are, Sometimes there are two or three state-owned companies bidding for the same projects, those in uh, Chinese companies. So in a way, I would say at this moment, they don't have control over the kind of energy infrastructure they are building. It is being built for them. Uh, good or bad, I am not, not in a position to judge, but that is what is actually happening at the moment. One last question, if there is any, any, any hand that is Yes, I think one direct remark on that is um, in Pakistan you do actually have I mean, the LNG uh, two importer most for fans, but the towers and the turbines they're building are provided by General Electric and Siemens. So I wouldn't, I mean, I don't know how much that makes up in the entire growth prospect that they do, but these are all, and they're planning a third one which is Exxon involved. So I wouldn't quite. 
we should. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know whether it's the Chinese government paying um, Exxon the money or Qatar for the money to build this. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure, but I, I, I'm not quite sure they're selling their or building their entire infrastructure purely with the Chinese. I know they're strong on the Belt and Road Initiative and they're participants of it, but I, I think there's been, but in blunt, I think there's a bit more going on there. Um, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, guys. Sort of. Uh, sorry, Arish. I, I think we can continue this conversation later on a different, uh, you know, context. But at this point in time, I think it would be best to probably uh, formally declare this panel discussion uh, you know, over because we have had an extremely, extremely rich and vibrant series of issues that we have discussed. So please uh, join me in giving the panel a very big round of applause. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Professor Ravan, Dr. Narayan, Mr. Shum, and Henning. And let me hand over to Anish. Thank you, Dr. Pavit, and our distinguished panelists. It is my pleasure to now invite Professor Ang Bai Hua to present tokens of appreciation to our invited speakers. Firstly, Mr. Ang Bai Chu. Thank you, gentlemen. We will now invite Dr. Christopher Lin, Senior Research Fellow, Energy Studies Institute, NUS, to deliver the vote of thanks for the conference. Dr. Lin, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of ESI, I'd like to thank our co-organizers, the Institute of South Asian Studies, especially uh, Ambassador Pillai, for working with us to make this event uh, such a success. On behalf of ESI and ISIS, I'd like to thank the Chief Executive of EMA, Mr. Ng Wan Chong, for your support. Uh, I'd also like to thank the keynote speaker, Mr. Vikram Nekra, uh, Mehta, for the very thoughtful speech. And also uh, thank you, the speakers from the panel, uh, this uh, discussion panel today. ESI focuses on the topic of energy, and ISS has a geographical focus on South Asia. Energy demand in South Asia is growing, and both our institutes thought that it would make sense to work together to examine South Asia's energy development. So for the very first time, uh, we are working together and it is a great success. So yesterday we had a workshop involving local and overseas participants focused on South Asia's uh, energy transition challenges. And uh, we covered issues uh, on transition from fossil fuels to renewables, political economy, climate change, and the low carbon economy. And we had the honor yesterday of having Professor Syed Munir Kasru, Chairman of the Institute for Policy, Advocacy and Governance as keynote speaker. And at the event, he spoke about regional integration in South Asia through energy connectivity. So from this workshop, we plan to have an edited volume uh, based on the papers submitted by the participants. So uh, stay tuned. And the conference today has been excellent. Uh, ESI and ISIS will discuss how we can put more together to highlight South Asia's energy transition. And we would like to facilitate dialogue among the key actors and also to help promote understanding of how energy developments in this important region will affect Singapore. Finally, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to all the people involved in the planning and organizing of this event. From uh, ISAS, there's uh, Dr. Narayan, uh, and then uh, Dr. Amitendu Palit, and then also Mr. Anik Singh, and Mr. Rajiv Chaturvedi. Uh, we work quite closely together uh, to frame the agenda, and as you can see, we, we had a very good uh, result. And, um, 
I would also like to thank my ESI colleagues, uh, Professor Anthony Owen, Dr. Liu Yang, and Mr. Hari and P for working with me on the ESI side. And finally, I'd like to thank the ISAS and ESI event team who worked tire tirelessly behind the scene. So thank you, Jordan, Yusuf, Sheila, Sitara, uh, Peggy, and then uh, Jen and Norman from the ESI side. And then also thank you, uh, Ankush, for being the MC today. So please uh, join me in a round of applause for the